Welcome to Space News from the Electric Universe, brought to you by the Thunderbolts Project at thunderbolts.info. It's perhaps one of the great unresolved yet overlooked mysteries facing academia and science. The extraordinary identities of planets in myth and tradition. Nothing in the familiar ideas about our history can explain the incredible patterns found in extensive cross-cultural comparison of words, phrases, imagery, and storytelling describing a former age of gods and goddesses, of heroes and monsters. Nothing in our familiar experience can explain, for example, why archaic astronomical traditions utilized the precise words and phrases for the planet Venus that they used for a comet just one of countless global patterns that demand investigation. And just as Venus was characterized as a comet or as a goddess with streaming hair, the planet Mars appears in ancient myth as a masculine warrior hero figure, a dragon slayer, the god of war. What about the appearance of these pinpoints of light in our sky today would lead ancient peoples to ascribe such bizarre yet consistently specific characteristics to these celestial bodies? For decades, the chief principals of the Thunderbolts Project and colleagues have sought to answer this question through an interdisciplinary approach, fusing the disciplines of plasma science, electrical engineering, geology, and comparative mythology. In the late 1960s and early 70s, the creator of the Thunderbolts Project, Dave Talbot, was originally inspired by the research of best-selling author Emanuel Velikovsky and his book, Worlds in Collision. Dave Talbot and his brother Steve produced a hugely popular academic journal called Ponce, alternatively titled Emanuel Velikovsky Reconsidered. One of the young academics to read this journal was Ev Cochran, who subsequently became a close colleague of Talbot and the late Duardo Cardona, all working to reconstruct the celestial events in prehistory recorded in world myth and religion. Cochran has authored four books on his remarkable academic research including Martian Metamorphoses and the Many Faces of Venus. In part one of this two-part presentation, we asked Ev to begin by elaborating the incredible global patterns in myth and tradition identifying Mars as the warrior hero. Well, ver very early on, I was determined to test the Velikovsky Talbot thesis by examining the earliest astronomical traditions from like Mesopotamia and Egypt. Early on, I looked at the hymns to the god Nurgle, for example, and the hymns themselves will describe Nurgle as a star in heaven. And we know it was identified with the planet Mars by the Babylonian astronomers themselves. And when you read those hymns, you will find Nurgle described as this agent of catastrophe and uh, raining fire from heaven, that kind of thing. So, for example, one hymn reads, Warrior, raging storm tide, who flattens the lands in upheaval. Uh, warrior, lord of the underworld, raging storm tide. And so it looked like Nurgle was a catastrophic agent. Of course, no mainstream scholar had recognized that fact. And so... To test that idea, I looked into traditions surrounding the planet Mars uh, from every continent on Earth. One of the first places I looked was North America. And for example, the Skiddy Pawnee have an astronomical religion. They identified the planet Mars as a warrior, a raging warrior. When they went to war themselves, they claimed they were emulating the planet Mars. And so they would paint themselves red and they would artificially induce angriness into the equation. And so that's how they worshipped the planet Mars. And it, it was a almost a one-to-one -one parallel to the Babylonian traditions surrounding the raging planet Mars. The more I looked into it, you look at the language in the respective hymns. And so, for example, the word describing the planet Mars as, as raging is hush, H-U-S, and that word also means red. And so you get the impression that this astrophic agent is 
not only red, but it's a star and it's doing something that connotes raging or angriness or belligerence. And in a nutshell, it's the definition of the planet Mars in cultures all around the world, whether you're talking China, Australia, ancient Greece, Egypt, it doesn't make any difference. Uh, that prototype of the planet Mars will be found everywhere. In uh, the earliest Indian traditions from Asia, you will have um, statements like, the warrior is virtually Indra, his weapons are Indras. And in Babylonian literature, Nurgle is identified as the wolf star. The planet Mars is identified as the wolf, clearly. So if you turn to Latin mythology, you find out that the, the god Mars was identified as a wolf. If you go to Greece, Ares is described as a wolf. And in Homer, the word used to describe the rage of the warriors like Achilles and the other great warriors is Lysa, L-Y-S-A, and that means wolf-like. And so warriors all around the planet, whether it's in North America, whether it's in ancient Germany, they always dressed up as warriors to try, try and emulate the planet Mars. So one scholar wrote, by putting on the skin of a wolf, the warrior assimilated the behavior of a wolf. In other words, he became a wild beast warrior, irresistible and invulnerable. Now he's describing the Germanic warriors, but that same statement would apply to the Skitty, Pawnee, it would apply to South American warriors. So it's just meaningless at one level. And yet, if you connect the dots, you see that they're emulating a celestial prototype. And that prototype is the wolf star known as the planet Mars. The global patterns in myth and tradition not only reveal extraordinary individual identities for planets, we also find remarkable relationships between planets, which will never be explained by what we observe today. Such is the case with the, quote, masculine planet Mars and the, quote, feminine planet Venus. Very early on, I uh, learned that Mars was the prototypical male partner in a, a sacred marriage with the planet Venus. So you always find the planet Mars in close conjunction with the planet Venus. So, for example, the one people are most familiar with is Homer's account of Aries affair with uh, Aphrodite, for example. And, you know, according to the Greeks themselves, Aphrodite was the planet Venus. So you will find similar myths like that all around the world. So if you go again to the Skitty Pawnee, the central myth in their astral religion talks about creation being due to the masculine Mars impregnating and having a sacred marriage with the planet Venus. Virtually the same thing is described in ancient Mesopotamia, where it's the planet Venus, Inanna, that has a sacred marriage with a character named Demutsi, and that leads to creation. And if you go to Egypt, it's Horus that has a sacred marriage with Hathor. So you find this same situation everywhere you look. Very early on, one of the most important papers on the subject was Dave Talbot's Servant of the Sun God, which published in Aeon 1989. And in that article, Dave identified a hundred different motifs associated with Mars. And we could easily have identified a thousand. I mean, we're, there are countless, literally countless of motifs that will be found around the world associated with the planet Mars virtually none of which have ever been recognized as such by mainstream scholars. In the current sky, of course, Mars can never appear in front of Venus because Mars is an outer planet and Venus is an inner planet, so Mars cannot appear in front of Venus. But in our theory, uh, Mars is set in the center of Venus. And so very early on, we discovered that Mars is always defined by his relationship to this Venus god. He's the male, she's the female. He's the king, she's the queen. He's the pupil of the eye. Venus is the eye of heaven. Uh, he is Horus, she is Hathor. The name Hathor means the house of Horus, and that just perfectly describes the relationship between these two bodies. Venus is 
much larger than the planet Mars. So Mars appeared as a tiny object in front of Venus when it was close to Venus. As, as we'll discuss later on, Mars moved around significantly during the time of the polar configuration. So it one of the signature characteristics of Mars is that it becomes a giant and swells as it moves towards the planet Earth. But the key is discerning that Mars is defined by its relationship to Venus. So, for example, one of the most bar motifs is Venus is described as the strength of Mars. And so in, in myths from 2500 B.C. in Mesopotamia, Inanna is said to give her power to Demutzi, and Demutzi, as a result, shines in luminous splendor. And in Vedic myth, uh, Indra's wife is his strength. In Egyptian myth, uh, the, where the eye of Horus is specifically identified with the planet Venus, the pyramid texts say, this is the eye of Horus through which you become great. You gain might through it. So it's, again, it's Mars is getting his might or his power from the planet Venus. And that is, in a nutshell, that de defines their relationship. And one of my favorite myths on that subject, Egypt is describing warrior hero Horus uh, going into war, and they specifically describe him as going to war together with his mother. Now, what self-respecting warrior would be described as uh, being mommy on his way to the, the battlefield? That's a very ancient tradition that just is a dead giveaway that Mars was, you know, Horus. Horus was operating in close conjunction with Venus. By the same token, 2500 BC, the, the greatest warriors in the history of Mesopotamia, they always announced that they're heading into war accompanied by a nana. I mentioned that um, one of the signature characteristics of the planet Mars is that it swells in size. And so every single Martian hero, strangely enough, is described on the one hand as a giant hero, like Her Hercules was you know, described as a towering figure by ancient Greek writers. And yet the very same fellow is described as a dwarf. So Hercules is a dwarf, a dactyl. Obviously, that can never happen in the real world. But because the planet Mars moved on this elliptical orbit between the planet Venus and Earth during the polar configuration, it appeared to increase in size dramatically as it moved towards the Earth. And so you get accounts where uh, Indra swells to the size of a mountain, for example. In ancient Polynesia, for example, the planet Mars was known as the quick sweller. Again, Nurgle, the Mesopotamian god of the planet Mars, he has several epithets that, that describe him as, as the sweller. And it, usually you're swelling in war and swelling in rage, that type of thing. But clearly, that is something that would not be expected ordinarily. Statistically speaking, if you just took a random sampling of cultures around the planet, statistically, there should be hundreds of cultures out there that should describe the planet Mars as a female being. But you, you're just never going to find one. Mars is always male. Venus is always female or almost always female. And so that alone suggests there's a mystery to be explained. Another extraordinary recurring pattern in the stories of Mars as the warrior hero is his fantastic role as the slayer of a biologically impossible creature, a dragon. In my book, Martian Metamorphoses, I, have a, I think I have a chapter called The Dragon Slayer. And so I try and identify certain motifs found around the world, like where the warrior hero jumps into the belly of the dragon and traditionally either lights a fire in its belly or hacks his way out and, and thereby kills the dragon. So that's, that's a famous myth surrounding the Greek Hercules. But it, the same myth is going to be found on, in numerous ancient cultures. The more you look into such myths, you find that 
the dragon itself was a celestial object or is, or had a celestial prototype. Inanna, for example, was described, Inanna, the planet Venus, was described as a great dragon flying about the sky and raining, raining blood from the sky, that type of stuff. A myth found around the world finds eclipses being attributed to a dragon swallowing the sun. The more you look into that type of myth, you will see a specific relationship between the object being swallowed and Hercules being swallowed by the dragon. <laughs>